I want to tell you the story of how a system bacteria have evolved to protect themselves and our quest to understand our own genomes have come together to catalyze a revolution in biology and transform human medicine. So we often think of bacteria as pathogens, but actually, like all life forms, bacteria themselves are vulnerable to infections. They're hosts to a class of viruses known as phages, which comes from the Greek word to devour. And these viruses inject their DNA into bacterial cells and use these hosts to make more copies of themselves. And by doing that, they quite literally eat the bacteria from inside out. So now these bacteria aren't entirely defenseless. So many of them have evolved this sophisticated immune system called CRISPR. And using the CRISPR system, bacteria can actually take pieces of a viral DNA, copy them into their own genomes, and later use these pieces as templates to guide CRISPR proteins to cut up any viral DNA that match these templates. So in this way, in this way bacteria can adapt and respond to their environment and pass on that knowledge to their progeny. So bacteria have an immune system. That's really neat, right? Just hold on to that thought for a second, and let's talk a little bit about genetics. So we've known for a fairly long time now that many of our traits can be ascribed to our genes. You know, bad hair, great teeth. We can blame our parents for those, or thank our parents for those. But really, many of these traits are just inevitable functional outputs of a series of bases, A, C's, G's, and T's, that make up our genome. In fact, these four bases, bases of DNA encode just about all the diversity there is in life. And as biologists, we naturally spend a lot of time thinking about these genes and their functions. What do they do? Now, we actually know a fair amount about the genetic makeup of our own species and those of other species, too. We know, for example, that the human genome is about three billion bases long. That's a lot of bases. And of those bases, the vast majority, about 99.9%, .9 are identical across all human species. But that still leaves about 0.1%, or three million differences on average between any two individuals. What do these differences mean? Which ones of these, for example, protect us from disease like cancer or diabetes? And which ones of them just, eh, don't matter? And how do we go about answering these questions? So that's where genome editing comes in. Now, imagine for a second if we can just take a cell and make one precise, exact change in its genome and just wait and see what happens. And now imagine if we can do that with any cell in any organism. So the idea of genome editing itself is not entirely new. It's actually a tool that biologists have been using for decades. We can actually just put a piece of DNA inside a cell. And sometimes, just sometimes, the cell will naturally copy that piece of DNA into its own genome. But this is not really an efficient process in general, and sometimes it just doesn't happen at all. So we need a way to basically make this very fickle process more reliable. Well, it doesn't surprise anyone that cells are very careful with their genome, and they actually have a whole arsenal of mechanisms to minimize any damage done to their DNA. And when these damages do happen, they fix them quickly. So for example, if there's a break in the DNA of a cell, the cell is going to want to stitch the two ends back together. But these mechanisms aren't perfect, cells aren't perfect, and sometimes they make mistakes. And it turns out we can actually leverage this process of DNA damage and repair to our advantage. 
In other words, we can deliberately make a break in the DNA, damage it, and while the cell is trying to repair it, we can sneak in a repair template and in a way kind of trick the cell into copying this repair patch into its genome and modify it in the way we want. Yeah, so this is a very simple idea, yeah? But there's an important caveat here, which is that DNA damage is not a good thing in general, and that's why you should wear sunscreen. <laughs> so just like in doing surgery, we don't want the surgeon to cut randomly, and we don't want to cut the genome randomly either. If we want to modify one gene, we better make sure we just cut it there and only there. So with that in mind, we can kind of reduce the problem of genome editing down to finding a pair of molecular scissors that we can precisely control. So as it turns out, you've already met this pair of scissors in bacteria. So remember from earlier that bacteria use CRISPR proteins to cut up viruses, to cut up DNA from viruses. One of these proteins is called Cas9. And Cas9 is guided to its DNA target by small RNAs. So this part is kind of important because we understand pretty well how RNA interacts with DNA. If we just look at the sequence of the RNA guide, we know where it's going to cut in the DNA because these bases match. So conversely, if we have a new DNA target in mind, then all we need to do is to rewrite that piece of RNA and make it match our wanted intended DNA target. So you see that if we were to recode this small piece of RNA to target the human genome instead of the viral genome, then we can turn Cas9 into that pair of scissors we want. So a few years ago, I was a graduate student at the Broad Institute in the lab of Dr. Feng Zhang, and I was recruited onto this cool new project at the time. And the idea was that we can take Cas9 from a bacteria called Streptococcus pyogenes, modify it, and then make a new guide for it, and then put everything into some human cells we were growing in a Petri dish. So we did that, and then we waited, and then we waited, and a few days later, we sequenced these cells. And then just as we had hoped, we could see the scars of DNA damage and repair. In other words, mutations exactly where we thought they'd be. This was really exciting. So we started making more and more mutations in actually all sorts of cells, not just in human cells, but rat cells, mouse cells, other kinds of mammalian cells, and not just one gene at a time, but sometimes two genes, three genes, multiple genes at the same time. And sure enough, every single time, we could induce mutations in the cell exactly where we wanted them to be. So we published our finding in the Journal of Science in early 2013, and shared these constructs with the scientific community. And soon enough, scientists all over the world, along with us, started using this very simple system to model genetic variations and mutations in all sorts of cells for all sorts of diseases. So what have we learned so far? Well, just in the last three years, CRISPR has helped us uncover mutations associated with drug resistance in cancers like melanoma, leukemia. It's shed light. It's given us some clues on genetic variations or mutations that might protect us against viral infections from dengue, from West Nile virus and in a way that mirrors its original purpose in bacteria, Cas9 has even been used to cut out viral genes like from HIV and hepatitis B from infected human cells. And just like we can model disease using CRISPR, we can also use the system to mend 
the genome of diseased cells. So take, for example, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is a debilitating disorder that affects one in every three to 5,000 newborn boys. These boys are missing a protein called dystrophin because of a mutation in that gene. And because they can't really protect their muscles in the normal way, they gradually waste away by the time they're 25 years old, and there's no cure yet. We've known about these mutations that cause Duchenne's muscular dystrophy for about 30 years. And just in the last two years, our collaborators at Duke University and Harvard University have started trying to develop a therapeutic Produces muscular dystrophy using CRISPR. So what they've done is they've used the system to cut out the diseased part of the gene in mouse models. And as you can see, they're already seeing some pretty impressive results. And just like with Duchenne's, we can use similar strategies to tackle diseases like sickle cell anemia, ALS, Huntington's, cystic fibrosis, and the list goes on and on. A lot of diseases where the genetic cause of the disease is well-defined. And the applications for CRISPR isn't just limited to modeling or curing human disease either. We can actually inject the entire system into the embryos of animals and plants. And by doing that, we can actually confer certain traits to agriculturally important crops or livestock. So now various people are experimenting with using CRISPR to create mildew-resistant wheat, or drought-resistant corn, or cold-resistant potatoes. So you can see that all of these advances might help us move towards more sustainable farming practices one day. And as we are taking on these more and more ambitious projects, of course, we also have to be very mindful of the risks and challenges associated with this technology. And right now, one of the biggest concerns for Cas9, especially in the area of therapeutics, is safety. Now, all drugs might have some side effects, but cutting the wrong place in the genome can be problematic. And Genome editing by its very nature is permanent, so that's really not something we want. So of course the targeting accuracy or specificity of Cas9 is really, really important. So many of us have been working in this area and in the last several years, we've actually come up with several new methods to, to improve the targeting accuracy of Cas9 and minimize these potential side effects. Now, these methods, I wouldn't say they're perfect yet, but they've actually already come quite a long way and will continue to improve. And in editing the genome of complex and multicellular organisms, such as ourselves, we face yet another very daunting challenge, and that's one of delivery. So now we're not talking about just editing cells in a petri dish anymore or injecting the system to edit a few cells in an embryo. We have to somehow get these tools into the right cells and right organs in the living organism. And we have to do it in a safe and efficient way. And that's no trivial problem. So that's actually another area of very active research. Well, luckily for us, we can actually continue to draw inspiration from nature. There are hundreds, if not more, of other CRISPR systems out there. And more recently, my colleagues and I found another one from a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. Now, some of you might know this as MRSA. It's a bacteria that causes flesh-eating disease. And ironically, it's given us a new therapeutic tool because this Cas9 is smaller than the first one we developed, it actually works really well for in vivo applications. And just this last year, entirely new types of CRISPR systems have been discovered. Some of them don't use Cas9 at all. So undoubtedly, all these discoveries are opening up entirely new fields of applications. 
So all of this is to say that there's some incredibly powerful tools in nature. And we just have to be clever enough to find them, to modify them, and to use them, whether it's for advancing biology or improving agriculture or treating human disease. There's enormous diversity in microbes, in bacteria, in archaea, in viruses. And who knows what's going to change the world out there? Thank you. <laughs>